thank you all for taking time out of your schedule to join us for an hour um, webinar on evolution of pumps and how to incorporate them into your patient's care plan. As usual, please submit any questions in the Q&A and we will have a um, 10, hopefully a 10 minute um, time span at the end that we can really dig in deep to some of the questions you may have. So I am really excited and, and we are very lucky to have three expert clinicians with us tonight that are gonna be talking about pumps and their experiences past and present. Um, first, uh, we have Brandy McEwen and she is an OT with 20 plus years of experience as a lymphedema practitioner. She's a director of multiple outpatient clinics in South Georgia that specialize in lymphedema therapy and wound healing. Brandy's also a CEO of International Lymphedema and Wound Training Institute, which is a lymphatic um, certification school. And in addition to treating patients, I don't know where she finds the time, but she also works as a consultant to OTs, PTs, vein clinics, and wound clinics to start up lymphedema programs and expand their practice um, profitably. So Jennifer uh, Kaminiak is a graduate from Northwestern University and um, really has spent the majority of her career working with lymphedema and oncology uh, populations. She currently provides patient care at Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center and is an independent contractor at, in Chicago, Illinois. She's also passionate about promoting positive lifestyle changes, exercise, and lymphedema awareness. And then we also have our very own Helen Dempsey, who is an OT and a CLT, who is now actually um, in a role at Tactile as a key account manager. She is, um, so her experience is an, uh, as an outpatient clinic um, certified lymphedema therapist in St. Louis and New York, contributed to her passion for career um, cancer rehab and protocol development. And in her current role, she collaborates with cancer centers and rehab clinics across the country as they develop survivorship protocols for various cancer types. And my name is Julie. I'm um, employed here at Tactile Medical as a clinical specialist as well. So here are our um, financial disclosures. And tonight we're going to start it off with a full question. Since we are talking about the evolution of pumps, we want to really know what year do you think the first commercial pump was manufactured in the United States? All over the board. Wow, that's so interesting. Thinking about when it, you know, the first lymphedema center in the United States and, and when MLD started. Okay, so 1960 was the top choice, um, but you know, absolutely, that's that's awesome to see that um, you're interested in knowing and and thinking about when those pumps first were um, developed. So as you can see here, um, there has been a long history of the progression on treatment for lymphedema or chronic edema from a device utilizing force with a suction cup in 1834 to the first commercially manufactured one chamber air system developed in the US in 1960. So those that said 1960 were correct. And that was developed by um, Conrad Jobst. So um, as you can see here in the picture, can you imagine a one chamber pump just inflating and deflating. Um, I, I can imagine a, a lot of that fluid was just actually getting displaced and, and moved all over the place, kind of like a water balloon. So he was a German immigrant and an inventor. He struggled on, uh, he also struggled with severe venous insufficiency. And it was actually in this, uh, while he was standing in a pool, that he realized he was um, sensing relief from the pressure on his legs that sparked his idea to create a device to mimic the gradient compression of the water or the, the gradient pressure. And this one chamber pump was really considered the standard of therapy for many years and eventually grew into multi-chamber systems with the actual first gradient pressure device manufactured in 1994. So there have been significant changes in the development and the efficacy of pumps. In the past, the word pump 
has really had a negative connotation because some of the more basic high pressure pumps with fewer chambers resulted in worsening of the patient's condition. But so much has changed. We now know that pneumatic compression is an important adjunct to help patients really manage their chronic edema at home. It wasn't until 1986, though, that Medicare began providing coverage for segmented and non-segmented type pumps. And in 2011, the National Lymphedema Network actually recognized the importance of pumps for the home management phase of treatment. So Tactile Medical um, started and incorporated in 1995, and they developed the very first version of our FlexiTouch. Um, at that point, and then in 2017, developed the first and only pneumatic compression device for the treatment of head and neck related lymphedema. So as you look on the timeline, the NCCN guidelines also recognizes the importance of early identification of lymphedema in stages zero and one when they are more responsive to treatment rather than waiting to, for stage two and three. And just last year, over this past year, they made another update and change, which included the importance um, of educating the patient on the consideration of pneumatic compression along with um, along with the other components of MLD garments. And, and this would, again, be for uh, the management of chronic edema within the home. So we have another poll question. Um, as we move forward, we would love to know who is in the audience and what type of patients do you mostly see in your practice today? A lot of vascular. Breast cancer, primary lipedema, that's, that's excellent. So no, it's no, kind of no. even a little between vascular and, and breast cancer, but mostly vascular. That sounds, that's nice to hear. Um, you know, I think all of us also treat vascular patients along with breast cancer and other oncology patients. So as I mentioned, um, Helen is currently traveling throughout the country working with cancer centers and oncology rehab programs. So she right now is going to, um, we're going to move on and she's going to talk a little bit more in depth about uh, lymphatic pathogenesis and also the um, incidence of lymphedema. Awesome. Thank you, Julie. So uh, quite often I do encounter providers uh, who do think of lymphedema as swelling. Um, so over the years, research pertaining to lymphedema um, only acknowledges that active swelling, um, sometimes it specifically says that two centimeter increase or a 10% volume increase, um, that's what kind of earns the diagnosis of lymphedema. Um, and often that's when we are able to treat. Um, so that's kind of the, the old um, history of lymphedema. Um, now we have a way better understanding of the lymphatic system. So we do know that swelling is a clinical proxy for an underlying disease. Um, so this kind of shows us that we must consider the presentation of fibrosis, inflammation, um, infection, and compromised immunity. Um, these are all signs of lymphatic system failure. So we certainly don't want to only treat a patient with active visible swelling. Um, oftentimes we may really miss um, another sign of lymphatic failure or dysfunction um, if we're just waiting for that swelling to occur. Um, so then on the, on the next slide, we also talk a little bit about um, kind of just, you know, how often do we see swelling, uh, lymphedema. Um, so that goes back to the current literature. Um, so the past two or three years really show a pretty drastic change in the reported incidence of lymphedema. Um, and most of these research studies are considering bioimpedance spectroscopy. spectroscopy. Um, so this is a non-invasive technique um, to measure the volume of fluid in various parts of the body. Um, so it's BIS, um, and this involves passing an extremely low strength electrical current through the area, and it measures how the flow of current is, is slowed um, by the fluid in the body. So this actually helps us understand when um, there's a disruption of lymphatic fluid. Um, so now we understand the 
that lymphatic system damage is common. Um, so we don't need to wait for disease progression before we educate and intervene. Um, so this just kind of shows us, you know, nearly 50% of breast cancer survivors do experience this. Um, I would say that percentage is kind of staggering to some of us and it's a little bit shocking. Um, and I would say that um, rarely do clinics actually treat 50% of their patients um, with the education, the resources and the tools um, to manage their lymphatic system long-term. Um, then, you know, gynecological cancer survivors, um, no one in this group actually selected that as the primary population that they treat um, because most of the time we don't screen for it um, and we don't have a proactive protocol. Um, a few clinics do. Um, so if you do, please reach out. I'd love to hear more. <laughs> um, but most of the time we don't have um, a very proactive protocol for our gynecological cancer survivors, um, similar with prostate. Um, you know, up to, I think one of the stats I've recently read that up to 36%, um, and that's really focused more on, um, you know, recurrence and the disease um, and looking in the right areas, um, really symptom screening to identify those symptoms prior to um, an escalation of that disease into an extremity. Um, and then finally, with our head and neck cancer survivors, um, upwards of those 90%, um, usually much higher in a lot of the recent literature. Um, so it's just quite common. Um, and we're, we're realizing that and how to do better with a proactive protocol. So Helen, just based mm -hmm. on the numbers, number of um, clinicians in the audience that treat vascular, can you comment on that as well? Because I, I feel like it's the same. Is that Absolutely. Yeah. So over the years, and I think Brandy's not her head. She sees a lot of a lot of the CVI and um, chronic venous uh, ulcer patients. Um, you know, it's now it's been 20, 2010 was the revised Starling principle. So we're slowly kind of peeling back um, the onion and realizing that a lot of that chronic venous insufficiency has a lymphatic failure underlying cause. Um, so you know, very large percentage of those patients have both. Um, if you've ever heard the term flebo lymphedema, um, you know, it's, it's venous insufficiency and it's lymphatic dysfunction. So we have to treat that dual system failure. Otherwise we're missing a piece. Um, so Brandy, any other contributions? Let me know. <laughs> yeah, we've definitely, um, we're seeing more and more of this, not that it wasn't already there, but right. that we're actually better diagnosing it and we're having better, um, relationships with lymphedema therapists and vascular surgeons. And so that we see that we can significantly assist each other. It's not just a one-way street there. So we've really seen some great advancements with that dual treatment um, with the vascular surgeon and lymphedema and we get some amazing results that way. And, and you are really in it deep, aren't you, Brandy, with your practice yeah. and some of the yeah. wound and vein clinics in your area? Yes, we've been, I've actually been working with um, one vascular surgeon for over 20 years. You know, we were a little ahead of our time, didn't realize it at the time. However, um, being able to realize that being able to fix the lymphatic dysfunction definitely increases the, um, the outcomes that the vascular surgeon does as well. So, and then we also realize that sometimes we have to reduce that patient before that patient can actually have any better procedure some right, as well. right. Um, exactly. so um, definite um, back and forth there mm -hmm. with those vascular surgeons and then we've um, shared that same component that we've achieved over all of these years with um, many of the surrounding of vascular surgeons in our area and um, in multiple states as well now so that they can continue to grow lymphedema programs um, for that mutual benefit. Yeah, I think that this is such great information because yes, there's been progress, but so many um, physicians, providers, clinicians still still need um, education and awareness on, on the progression and those early symptoms and signs of lymphedema. Definitely. Speaking of star lanes, um, I know that many of you may be familiar with the revised Starling principle, which explains how uh, microcirculation works. Um, as illustrated on the left here, it demonstrates how filtrate exits the capillaries on the arterial side um, into the interstitium due to that hydrostatic pressure. However, due to the endothelial glycocalyx layer lining that vessel that you can see on the right, 
Um, this disrupt, disrupts the enchotic pressure gradient, preventing the venules from actually reabsorbing any interstitial fluid, which we had one at one time thought it was 90%. Um, and we know that's not true anymore. So this leaves the lymphatic system 100% responsible for the uptake of any fluids within the interstitium. Um, also know that in the presence of chronic edema, no matter what the etiology is, it doesn't matter. It is indicative of a failure of the lymphatic system to manage that fluid. Um, so in order, as you know, Helen just said, in order to address chronic swelling, we have to be looking always at addressing and treating uh, the lymphatics. So treating lymphedema. Um, most often includes complete decongestive therapy, as this is still considered the gold standard of treatment, which um, I think most of us know it includes gradient compression bandaging, education, skin care, extra exercises, and manual lymph drainage. But it also includes other components um, of treatment, just such as myofascial release, soft tissue mobilization, really addressing the fibrotic tissue, compensatory strategies. Um, Many clinicians use other modalities like the Hiva mat, the cupping. So there's a lot of, there's a lot that goes into treatment uh, for comprehensive care of patients. And we know that all patients would benefit from all of these components. Um, however, we also know there are several barriers that often prevent patients from even initiating or sometimes even completing CDT. And so I kind of think about some of the constraints that are upon clinics now, um, primarily due to um, staffing or insurance reimbursement, you know, transportation for the patient, the bandwidth of the staff, wait lines uh, or wait lists for patients to get into. So we know things have changed a little bit in terms of um, uh, how, how we think about our plan of care for patients so that they still get comprehensive care and um, within the time limits that we have. I don't know, um, Brandy and, and Jennifer, can you talk a little bit about some of the changes that you've seen over the years in terms of how much time you have to work with your patients and how you've changed uh, your approach? Well, for my clinic personally, um, I have some slots that are still an hour, which is what I was used to and, and have some freedom to extend that time depending on the patient. But now the majority of my treatment slots are 45 minutes with about two or three slots a day that are about an hour. Um, and so there's no guarantee that my lymph, all of my lymph patients will get into those longer slots. Um, and when I'm able to extend, I will, but so definitely seeing a, a you know, less treatment time and still have to complete the same amount of treatment. Um, so that, that is a, it's a barrier to being able to do all the MLD and, and treatment that I normally would like to do. Yeah, I think one of the other big things that we've seen over the last several years is that insurance companies have really cut down on the number of visits that patients have. Mm -hmm. And then also, being able to get those approved, right? So what I'm finding is that more and more of these insurance companies, some of these Advantage plans with Medicare are really starting to cut back on how many visits they're gonna approve at one time. So whereas I used to just, with my Medicare patients, I would, we would go to the cap, we would put the KX modifier, we would continue on, and we, we could just roll right along. However, now with some of these Advantage plans, what we're finding is that we might get three visits. We have to get a complete new um, approval in through the computer. Um, and then you still might only get another three visits. And so it makes it much more difficult on the practitioner. I'm a little stressful for the practitioner and the patient as well. And so, you know, I, what I'm finding is that you really have to make sure that we're creating those home programs right from the get go because we don't know if we're gonna get those approvals or not. And we're also finding that the patients that used to have 40 visits per, per calendar year are now cutting back to 20 visits per calendar year. That really kind of cuts things tight when you've got a really significant lymphedema patient. So I think that insurance has definitely dictated a lot of the way that we approach how we're gonna treat our patients and how, how early we're gonna start designing that home program which nowadays it really has to be from day number one. 
Right, which honestly, when we're talking about pneumatic compression, we know just from NCCN and you know NLN that yep, this is this is the way to go for home management. But given these changes, I mean, there there really can be a place for um, certain patients to utilize the device in phase one. And and what I'm thinking about is uh, wait times of four to six weeks. Um, I, I don't know, what do you think, Brandy or, or Jennifer, have, have you had patients that have been, or, or returning patients um, that can, you know, really focus on uh, trying to get some reduction before, before they can get into you in three weeks? I, does, do you see that in your practices? We do see that. So we do have a lot of, um, I've been in practice for quite some time. I've been in one clinic for 19 years. And so we do see a lot of reoccurring patients. And so when I do see those, we, we do typically end up on about a four to six um, week wait list. So when I see those patients that I know that they have a compression pump, I'm looking back at their records, the first thing I'm going to tell them is, please, I need you to start using your pump every single day, right? Because for starters, I'm on a four to six week wait list and I need you down as much as possible before you step into my doors. Okay. And so, and then definitely utilization of those compression pumps any time that that patient removes those bandages, we need to, to optimize all of our time. And so anytime we've got one of those pumps already at home, that is a great adjunct. Or over the weekend, do you have Absolutely. patients that some, and because sometimes patients don't want to wait the whole weekend to come to shower. And um, so they want to take some of those bandages off. If they can reapply, they certainly can use the device over the weekend as well. So yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so that kind of brings us into this next question, which is about the time that you have. I know that in my practice, I started at 75 minutes and then 60, and now I spoke with somebody and they are down to 45 minutes per session. So on average, given, given the severity of the patients um, and the variables, of course, what is your time now that you are actually doing hands-on MLD? Well, I'm glad to see uh, no, one is, no one is doing just zero to 15 minutes. <laughs> but also, uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't see very many people having the um, luxury of having greater than 75 minutes. And, you know, when I was practicing, I had bilateral um, large patients that really required 90 minutes sometimes. And that's kind of um, long gone, I think. So it looks like 30 to 45 is pretty much the standard and, and, 40, and then 45 to 60. Okay, interesting. So I think we're gonna move on and just have Helen really talk about the differences between uh, basic and advanced pumps. Awesome, thanks, Julie. Um, so just kind of a brief um, overview of a basic pneumatic compression um, is typically covering um, just the extremity. Um, some do have a little padding or um, like a strap going across the chest, um, but they do not provide um, like are often they do not provide that proximal clearance. Um, and most of the time it's a squeeze and release mechanism of action in a basic device. Um, it typically is required by Medicare um, for at least four weeks um, prior to a qualification for an advanced device. Um, so it kind of depends on the insurance coverage. Um, as far as the advanced device, um, you know, typically it's going to be that, it's the gentle stretch and release um, instead of that squeeze and hold. Um, so the Flexi Touch specifically is designed to mimic the manual lymphatic drainage massage that we do in the clinics. Um, you know, any excess lymphatic fluid is able to cross watersheds. Um, so we're really redirecting um, excess fluid um, that's pooling in one area of injury. And we're relocating that fluid toward um, the healthier areas in the body. Um, and so um, in the Flexi Touch, there are a lot more chambers um, so the cha chambers um, are going to clear proximally first. Um, so often it's going to start in the abdomen, then work up if it's an upper um, into the chest, the bicep, the forearm, the hand, and then reroute that fluid um, from the hand back in toward those proximal lymph nodes. Um, so the Flexi Touch has up to 32 chambers, depending on the size and the coverage areas. Um, and it does treat the upper extremity, lower extremity, 
trunk or head and neck, depending on where the patient has symptoms. Um, most um, basic pneumatic compression devices are pretty similar. Um, I have experience with a handful of different types of basic um, pneumatic compression. Most of them do a squeeze, um, hold, and then release. Um, and most of them are anywhere from four to eight chambers. Um, and so that's kind of my ex personal experience um, from the basic standpoint. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah I, I was gonna say, I, I'll just add a few um, bits of information about FlexiTouch because they actually were designed to cross those watersheds. And so really keeping in mind the for the upper extremity, for example, crossing three watersheds to be able to actually move, uh, utilize as many lymphatic channels as possible and, and uh, as well as the head and neck and the lower extremities. But I think the, the one thing too that makes it an advanced device is the availability to adjust pressures. And so we can um, have the, the adjustment in certain particular chambers to particular regions, whether you want it increased to address challenging fibrotic areas, or you want it um, decreased for patients that perhaps um, have peripheral neuropathy or lipedema, for example. Um, certainly patients that have open wounds and have some pain, you know, the pressure can be decreased increased almost to zero and then continue to uh, utilize proximal clearing um, from, the, from the knee up and draw fluid away from peri-wound areas. And so there's just so many options and uh, abilities to tailor the program to fit the needs of your patient. Um, so when we talk about that advanced and um, advanced versus the basic pump. This is a study that was published in Physical Therapy Journal in 2007 by Dr. Merovitz and um, really wanted to look, what they wanted to look at was what is the actual application of pressure difference? And not only the, the time that the pressure was applied, but um, the amount of pressure and and the coverage of pressure, right? So you can see in the top image is the flexi touch, and you can see the peaks, which is exactly what Helen was talking about. It is designed to have a work and release dynamic um, stretch and release, inflation and deflation, one to three seconds, very, very similar to what we utilize in MLD. Um, it also, and you know, stimulates that initial lymphatic capillary that we were talking about with the Starling principle. And then um, it, it moves it into the lymphatic channels. And so that compared to the lower image, which is another basic pump, um, is a basic inflation sustained hold and deflation. So it's displacing fluid. It's also moving fluid through channels, which isn't, all bad for some patients, right? I mean, some patients do benefit and really can only um, qualify for a basic pump. So um, I'm not, you know, saying that it is inferior um, for some very select patients, but certainly the plexi touches or the, an advanced pneumatic compression device is always going to be better. Um, the thing about the, the basic pump is that it does move that fluid proximal through those channels of tissue and um, up into the areas, um, as Helen said there, you know, it ends, right? So if there's any concern of patients with um, pelvic cancers, for example, of more buttock, hip, pelvic, truncal, abdominal swelling, that would not be a, a pump that we would hope that the patient would be able to receive. So um, that's kind of a, any, any other comments about the two differences? No. So when we think about what are the determining factors for referring for pneumatic compression? And for many th therapists, I, I think if I ask that question, might all have a, um, a different answer depending on their clinic and in terms of when they're seeing their patients, at what stage they're seeing their patients, what they're actually, what their plan of care is for their patients. But I, I really wanna hear from the three experts here, uh, what your thoughts on this are. So Brandy, why don't you give me an idea of what your thought process is and, and what determines factors for referral? 
So, you know, I definitely take a look at every patient that I evaluate in our clinic to see if I, I try to think initially, is this patient gonna, gonna use the device? Is this patient have a chronic condition with lymphedema? And is it, is it, are we a one month out? Are we 10 years out? Where, where are we on that spectrum? All right. The other thing is I definitely look at their, um, their insurance. You know, I, how, how long do I have? Do I, do I have a little bit of time to see if this patient is going to be a person that I think is going to use this pump compliantly? Um, or do I need to go ahead and move because I don't have enough visits to, to even stop to think about that? And sometimes I'll go ahead and actually make that referral and, and then decide to talk to the patient about it just a little bit later. May not overwhelm them that first day, but for the majority of our patients that walk in our office, a compression pump is a wonderful adjunct. Not everyone is going to like the idea of it. Right. We know that. We, we know that not all, all patients, you, you, you mentioned a compression pump and that is something long-term and this is in their minds, they still think this is a, this is a short-term illness, right? And so when we, when we can start to talk about the, the pump, then we do actually breach that subject with those patients a little bit more. Sometimes it is on day number one. However, in my notes, in my evaluation, that's already been discussed um, on paper. Okay, so that we know that we've got the right documentation um, for almost all of those patients. Now, every now and again, you have a patient that you know is not going to be a good candidate for a flexi touch. Okay, we've got patients with dementia, we've got patients who are extremely terminal, things like that. Okay, but for the most part, when we look at a patient, um, we decide that first day whether we think they might be a candidate for a compression pump, okay? So a pneumatic device, whether they're gonna need the advanced pneumatic device, or maybe they really would just, just be more of a candidate for that, basic, um, for that basic pump, okay? But we definitely take a look at every single patient and at least document in that realm. I like that. I like the idea that you're you're thinking ahead for the patient, but not necessarily unloading that on the patient right away, right? So you're you're giving them time to adjust to not only education about the disease, because a lot of them don't know when they come to you, it's chronic, right? As you mentioned. And also um, so many clinicians, physicians, they say, oh, my patient's too overwhelmed. Absolutely. I, I agree. They are overwhelmed with all of the treatment that they are receiving. Um, however, starting that process early, and I, I think, Jennifer, I, I was talking to you earlier, and you had mentioned what your process is. Can you, can you walk through that with us? Sure. I wholeheartedly agree with Brandy with everything she said. And I think every patient that I see that either has chronic symptoms or has even a risk for chronic symptoms, I will think about the pump for them. So if they're, if they're coming in and they already have some symptoms, um, I might start that thinking about that process, or I typically will at least send the face sheet over to my rep. Um, and we have a really good relationship. So I will note, don't contact the patient. We're just getting the process started at the back end. But I'm thinking about um, what can make my patient successful lifelong with this chronic disease so that their home program is easy, right? Let's not give them um, more to do that is, that is challenging or fatiguing. Um, I want them to put all their energy on their exercises and everything else. Um, what can make lymphedema management easier for them? So um, a lot of my patients, it will be because they have chronic symptoms, but then I have some that are um, presenting with very acute symptoms, but I know they're a very high risk patient, meaning they had a lymph node dissection, radiation to those lymph nodes, maybe they're on uh, hormonal therapies, um, chemotherapies. Um, and so I know that this could be a tool that will help manage their risk um, and help prevent progression of disease and even um, for certain patients help decrease their pain. Like you mentioned neuropathy earlier. Um, I have referred um, patients to have the flexi touch for, to help with their neuropathy. And it has been very helpful for many of my patients. Um, so 
Absolutely. It's not, a, it's not a blanket thing for everyone. If I have a patient that says, no, I'm not interested, at least I'm like, that's okay. I wanted you to know about this product because I want you to know everything that's available, but we'll put that away for now. But I have so many patients that get very excited about the idea of having something to make their life easier. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, I think it's, it's how you uh, introduce it also, yes. you know, you can tell a patient this will make your life easier, maybe improve your quality of life, help you manage it. And I, I think that's a lot easier for patients to accept and be, you know, welcoming to than, than in, in some other ways. Um, but I like the idea of being able to, to work with your rep and also have that conversation and relationship close enough that you can say, listen, I've started the process. Now we can take um, some of that burden off of you, the therapist, as well as um, the patient and, and let the, the rep start to do some of the background work in terms of um, medical history and insurance and, and things like that, that, you know, at the end of the, at the end of phase one, you want that all to be ready and, and waiting for the patient and, and not have to deal with that stressful um, stuff on their own and, and with you as well. So I love that. So we, we have another poll question and that is really moving into what are myths and what are facts about pneumatic compression because that has changed also. Um, so what do you think? Um, is it a myth or a fact that pneumatic compression can cause cancer or to reoccur or to metastasize? And <laughs> No one, no one thinks it's a fact. That is amazing to me. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier and I, I had said, I, I just can't believe people are still asking this question. But Helen, you are stating, you are stating that, yes, you, you get this question quite often. I definitely hear it a lot. <laughs> I, I, I travel a lot all over the country. So whether it's a rural or um, an urban area. Yeah. Uh, I think people just get concerned. Of course, we don't want to cause any kind of detriment. Um, it's a complex cancer patient. So we'd certainly want to do our due diligence. Um, but now I feel like I have <laughs> read all the research. Um, so, I mean, Julie, I, I think you do such a fantastic job of kind of breaking down um, kind of from a cellular level. Um, so yeah, I love your yeah. <laughs> Talk. Yeah, so really, historically, it has been, you know, controversial in the medical community. And um, up until, I mean, really, about a year ago, I had a physician tell me, no, no, absolutely not. And, and so, you know, we certainly respect what providers think and what they say. But um, there is no evidence anymore, or there never has been, that stimulating lymphatic flow spreads cancer, either through MLD or inter, you know, pneumatic compression. We now know through clur current clinical data that the behavior and the specific biological factors of the cell, such as the grade, the size, the number of lymph node involvement, um, are really the drivers in um, what's going to have make a um, cancer metastasize or reoccur. It's not a passive system um, moving cells along. And if it were, the, then every cancer would metastasize because we our lymphatic fluid moves every day um, through movement and through breathing. And so I think we do have an understanding now and, and plenty of clinical evidence. And if anyone is interested, please uh, reach out and I can share you know, the clinical data that we have in terms of um, really debunking that myth about the spread of cancer or the recurrence of cancer with um, pneumatic compression. I also wanted to mention, because we get this question quite often as well, um, the other contradiction, contraindications with pneumatic compression, such as congestive heart failure, renal failure, um, DVTs, and infection. And um, I, I want to just say a blanket statement that if a patient is referred to a therapist for manual lymph drainage, then they are absolutely okay to utilize pneumatic compression as well. Um, all of those contraindications are, are more acute, um, you know, con you know, um, congestive heart failure, if it isn't managed, if they've had a recent episode of hospitalization, but if they are managed well and they are doing fine, it is not a counterindication. And, and we have patients 
all the time that have uh, chronic DVTs. Uh, we have patients that have, you know, congestive heart failure, renal disease. So, you know, don't ever hesitate to actually have a conversation with us. Uh, we have an entire clinical team that addresses these types of questions, and we are happy to have those conversations with anyone about it. I don't know if, any, if Helen, do you want to add anything to that? Or are we... I think that's perfect. Yeah, I think okay. it's all about, it's a case by case often. Um, if it's a chronic patient, usually it's a fine balance between managing them medically and then managing their lymphedema. If we just totally ignore the lymphedema, it's only going to get worse. Um, right, so really right. Need to be diligent and we need to take care and, and manage that lymphedema long term to prevent um, risk for infection. Absolutely. Right. As long as their medical management is, is fairly good, then they're then your contraindications aren't there. So make sure that the, they're, they're well man, medically managed and then you can treat the lymphedema. And if you're treating it in the clinic, then you can have a compression device. Right, yeah. Um, so how um, does the Flexi Touch work? And I, I, I think I got ahead of myself earlier. I apologize. Um, Helen was gonna talk a little bit about this. Do you, do you wanna add some information or do you think we've covered how it works in all of the different garments that we have? Yeah, just to keep it simple. I mean, yeah. the goal is to decongest the affected area and to utilize healthy areas. We're trying to reroute fluid um, away from that area of injury um, and, and reroute it toward healthy lymphatic vessels and healthy lymph um, nodes. Um, so depending on where that area of injury is, um, that's exactly what the FlexiTouch is designed to do. Um, then we get to modify it per patient um, for mobility, for donning and doffing, um, making sure that this is a very custom treatment um, for each patient. Um, so I think, I think we did a pretty good job covering it earlier though, as far as watersheds. Okay. Um, let's see, we do have one more poll question and this is in relation to, or actually, yeah, we can do the poll question and then we'll have our conversation. At what stage do you feel it's appropriate to refer pneumatic compression? 100%, no, okay, that's better. I would be very surprised if I heard that. <laughs> So really though, I, I love to see that it's early stages, zero or one and in stage two. Um, so thinking about when, you know, at what point, at what stage uh, we're referring, I wanna really hear from Brandy and um, Jennifer about what their thoughts are on in terms of what stage they're, they're looking at. So either, either one of you can chime in. I think we'd both agree that the earlier, the better if we're looking at someone who's facing a risk of lifelong chronic disease. So again, like I mentioned earlier, not every stage zero to one patient is appropriate. Maybe um, they're at a really low risk, but if the patient's showing signs and symptoms, um, we talked a little bit about the bioimpedance um, earlier. So I use that in the clinic. And so if I have a high risk patient and I'm starting to see trends that are giving me warning signals that we have early accumulation of fluid, um, I start that discussion. So I think the earlier, the better, because we want to prevent um, the progression of, of fibrotic changes and risk of infection and all the comorbidities and burden that our patients experience. So if a yeah. patient's referred to me at stage two or three, um, that's when I'm referring for the pump if they don't have one already. But if I have uh, a breast or a gynecological oncology patient um, who we're trying to make sure their quality of life is not impacted anymore by their um, cancer treatment side effects, um, I'm looking at those patients as will, will they benefit? And in so many cases, it's such a useful tool for them to have at home. Um, so I think you know as soon as, as soon as you're able, if it's appropriate, um, I think, uh, you know, my patients um, have, have truly benefited and, and enjoy using the device at home and we're seeing better outcomes where, um, you know, we don't have to use just compression to reduce risk, we can also use a pneumatic pump. I like that you're looking at risk factors for that patient and, you know, not everyone has a, a bioimpedance 
device sure. um, in their clinic. And, and I, I kind of want to just mention that we do have symptom screeners that I think have been very helpful mm -hmm. for clinics to start to recognize some of those subclinical signs um, in those early stages. Have, have you had success using those um, symptom screeners, Brandy or Jennifer? Um, yeah, definitely. So, you know, when we have lymph node removal, and especially when we get up into the higher numbers in those lymph nodes, um, then we're definitely going to take a look at, 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 at one of these devices, right? The other thing is, and I think that we had talked about this the other day, was that, you know, a lot of people still think that a breast cancer patient, when we get lymphedema, it's going to be in the arm. Well, what we're finding more and more and more of, right, is that it's in the breast. And we, we miss those really early symptoms of that breast lymphedema. And so we need to we need to be really, really cognizant of what those signs and symptoms are. And they are one of the they're they are a fabulous patient to get a advanced pump for, right? So the advanced humanic device is fabulous for those patients. And what we find is that a lot of those patients, so we've got a sentinel lymph node biopsy, but we know that the nodes that they removed are directly draining the breast, right? We, we know that now. And so they may have taken out the primary draining, drainage for that breast. And even though it might be three lymph nodes, they, they may have really significantly impacted the flow out of that breast. And so that patient might be the one that needs that pneumatic device even more so than sometimes a patient that had 10 lymph nodes removed. Exactly. Yeah. And they're not having really any symptoms at all. They're still at that stage zero. Okay. And I, I think, I was going to say, I think that so often some of the risk factors are, are not really looked at in terms of obesity. I mean, that is such a huge risk factor for lymphedema. Every single obese patient should really be considered um, in terms of what kind of subclinical signs are you having, educating the patient on what to look for, what to feel, and, and having them recognize that so that they can be monitored very closely. Um, even I mean, do you see that in your practices as well that, you know, sometimes some of those risk factors aren't really considered by the providers or by some of the people in your um, practices that don't have the education that you do? Sure. I don't think everyone, I, I hope it's more widespread knowledge. I don't think everyone knows the correlation between uh, BMI of over 40 and that link between right. uh, the stress to the lymphatic system. So I think that's becoming a little bit more widespread, but um, there's times I'm the first one to educate the patient that, you know, the reason that your, your lymphedema or your, is, is developing in your legs is, is because of your weight gain or obesity. Um, and I think the other thing is you know, a lot of patients don't realize that if you have radiation to your, to your lymph nodes directly, that those lymph nodes are forever changed um, and, and not as efficient as, as they were before. Um, so the breast lymphedema absolutely um, it is, is a big thing that, that we're seeing in the clinic a lot. Right. Um, and it's very, and it's very scary for patients because even if you've educated what it is, they're afraid that it's their cancer occurrence. Oh, um, right. Yeah. 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 That orange pill appearance is extremely frightening for those patients. So yes. if you do any kind of pre and post mastectomy program, please educate, please educate because they get really, really scared. Yeah, it's very absolutely. Important. Okay, so um, another another thing that is really yeah. important to, to think about as well, when I look at a patient and I know that we're having significant amounts of lymph nodes removed or um, we, I, I always look at the rest of the body as well. So do we have a patient who's already edematous, even in a mild form in the legs, right? When it's an arm patient. Or, or I listen to my patients as well. Well, my mom, she had that big arm after her surgery with gynecological issues. You know, make sure that we start talking to these patients about family history and looking at the rest of their body as well to see if there's any other factors that might make them at higher risk for developing lymphedema as well. Right, yeah, good point, really. Um, so, when we think about recommendations in terms of uh, protocol 
for the patient to utilize the device. Um, we all have had experience with patients that have really challenging areas, challenging issues. Um, Jen, can you talk a little bit about how you tailor the program for your patients in terms of some of those challenges? Sure. So if I have a patient, maybe it's the, the breast lymphedema or there's some fibrosis um, in a specific area, we might be using certain tools like a swell spot or um, obviously compression. Um, so I would like, you know, if the patient has a pneumatic device that will use um, the, the device after removing the swell spot or chip mat, um, or we can use the, um, the supplemental programs or, or the specialized programs where um, you know, they can run the whole sequence and then focus just on that area or whatever they have time for, maybe just focus on that area to help drain, for example, the breast or, or maybe if it's the hand that's being a little troublesome. So um, there are a lot of different ways that the programs can be set up and the rep can be really helpful with that um, to kind of um, set that up for the patient. And also when they do their home demo or set the device up with the patient, they can work with you to, to help the patient understand how to do that. I love that you use swell spots and, and then utilize them with the, with the device um, as well. So have you ever, because I, I often think when we when just kind of going back to some of the um, breast and breast swelling and some of that um, fibrosis that occurs underneath the breast, right? Um, have you ever used a chip pad or a swell spot there and, and tried to use the, the flexi touch? Have you had patients that um, benefited from that or is it mostly just on top of the breast? Um, I mean, if it's, if it's the breast, I, I prefer the swell spot that covers the entire breast. And the, the oh, you use like the yeah. severus. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the bigger, the better. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. get the whole area. It yeah, definitely. definitely. You know, uh, patient to patient, it will vary what will work best for them. But right, right, right. Um, yeah. So um, real okay. quickly with my breast patients, um, I find that with like a pendulous breast or any like type of breast edema, it's all about positioning. Um, yeah. So I'll have side lying. I'll have them try to lift up their breast tissue and try to like scoop um, underneath um, if there's like a poterage or kind of like a fibrosis um, or fibrotic area. Um, same thing for groin or um, like uh, genital swelling mm -hmm. um, kind of like mold to that area. Um, and so that's definitely where I would do like a spot treatment or a supplemental with the flexi touch to complement and then really focus on positioning. Um, so we can definitely help with that from our, from tactiles clinical team. Um, and then for frequency and for like a mild patient, I hope that they can use it as a spot treatment. Um, you know, so a lot of times if they can use it a couple of times a week and keep their symptoms managed, then they don't have to feel like tied to this machine. <laughs> um, they can feel a little more like kind of easygoing and, you know, okay, this is, I can manage my symptoms. I'm autonomous. Um, then of course, when we have a more severe patient, then they really may need to use that more often, you know, that daily recurrent treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Great information. Um, okay, so I think we want to talk just a little bit about what that process is and what it looks like for um, clinicians in terms of ease in documenting and you know efficiency and, and trying to make it as simple as possible for you as clinicians so that, again, as I mentioned, we want to take the burden off of you. So um, I think Brandy and Jennifer actually have a really good system. So I think I'll just um, ask you what you do, Brandy, in terms of your documentation. When you start the process, as you said, you start it very early. Um, you tell the, the rep that perhaps we're not going to have that discussion yet. We're, we're going to wait a little bit, which I think is just, you know, great um, communication with them. And then do you have a smart phrase or an EMR template or, you know, talk a little bit about some of the terminology that you utilize? So we definitely have smart phrases. So, and your rep can easily share those smart phrases with you. And really, <laughs> truly, as a, as a lymphedema therapist who teaches other lymphedema therapists, we need to utilize these smart phrases anyway, right? right. We need to use the proper terminology when we're discussing different elements of lymphedema, okay? So that smart terminology is not something that you're not already describing. 
it is something that you're already describing. You're just not necessarily using that term for that issue. Okay. So SMART terms are a must and they need to be started from the day of your evaluation. Okay. So that's the reason you need to go ahead and start to think about a pneumatic compression device from day number one, because your eval is very, very important with what you document in that evaluation as far as being able to get reimbursed from insurance, Medicare, <laughs> especially. Yeah. Okay. So Medicare um, is a little bit more challenging, but it's very, very doable if you've got the right documentation in place. Okay. Yeah. So that's, you, you've got to start that from day number one and then continue um, every time that you do, I, with Medicare, you do a 10 day update, right? With those 10 day updates, you need to make sure that you've got that same terminology that's following through with all of that, that you're continuing to put what your home program is, that you elevated those legs, that you did exercises, that you've um, educated that patient on compression garments when they're not in bandages, things like that. And then continue to focus on those truncal measurements, right? So make sure that when we start with these patients, we've got truncal measurements because guess what? You cannot get an advanced pump without, without truncal measurements. So start them from day number one. We need truncal measurements, okay? And then in our clinic, we have a phenomenal rep. Her name's Ashley. She's amazing. <laughs> and we have clinic days in my office. So once every month, maybe every two months, depending on our caseload shift, um, we have a clinic day. Now that clinic day runs from sometimes as early as seven in the morning, yes, she's amazing, until five o'clock in the afternoon. And we will see patients, she will see patients every hour throughout that day to demo them, to make sure that she takes all of that workload off of me so that I don't have to talk to that patient as much about the device and the finances and how we're gonna deal with the insurance part of that. And, the, and that whole piece. It's not that we don't have our, our therapist right there with her the entire time to be with those patients, but it takes a huge piece of the workload off of us. And it also keeps us constantly thinking, who else needs that pneumatic compression device? So those clin clinic days are super important in our clinic. That's great. I And you know, I think that it, the clinic days always amaze me that um, the number of patients that they can see in a day and demo in a day. And, and it just seems so efficient <laughs> it's it? rather efficient. than coming back all the time. I need this information. I need this information. Right. And no one wants us to come back and ask for that information. I, and I totally realize no. that. Right. No. And so, and, yeah, um, and we prepare our rep. We send everything in to her before she ever walks in our door. Right. She's completely prepared. When she walks in, she already has the information for the insurance. She's already run all of that. She can answer a zillion questions that I cannot answer on that day. So it is, it's, it's, the, it's the greatest day ever <laughs> when, when we're talking about being able to really get these patients, those devices and answer all of their questions and take away some of their fears that they're having as far as cost goes, as far as insurance goes, all of those sort of things, our, our, reps have, our rep has been fabulous with, with our patients on that end. Well, I'm glad to hear that. That's wonderful. Um, I think in the, just in the interest of time, we're going to move on. Um, I know, Jennifer, you do not have clinic days, but you, you have also told me that you have a very similar process in terms of your documentation, sure. um, mm -hmm. your demos, and, and oftentimes, and this is fine too, not everyone can have a clinic day, but certainly demos can be done in the home and they are all the time. So um, if you wanted to add anything else, I, I think that was pretty, pretty concise. I agree. Yeah. So smart phrases, templates make life easy. And then it even helps your insurance um, approval. You know, you're, you're supporting the ongoing need for therapy. Um, and I think that's a great way to look at it. Just like all of the other measurements we take for our orthopedic patients or in general, we're supporting the need of, of our therapy and, and, and the smart phrases that the rep can provide are, are perfect. I love that. Thanks. CDUs. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to end here just in terms of uh, recapping that we know 
pumps have come a long way. They've evolved quite a bit from that one chamber pump that just inflates to the advancement of um, pneumatic compression now that can really be tailored to each individual patient's needs. Um, certainly one other change I think over the years has, uh, for our company anyway, has just been the increase in focus on um, education and, and providing clinical input to providers and patients and you know have, having that staff that can really support you and, and your patients. So um, I think we are gonna just open it up um, to Q&A. We have a lot of questions. So thank you all so much for um, participating tonight. This was fantastic. So one of the comments um, I thought for Medicare patients that they have to be in therapy for four weeks to qualify for a pump. So how would you utilize the pump? And that is a common question. And either one of you can answer that. So even though, yes, they do have to have been in therapy for four weeks, but trust me, it's a process. So go ahead and start it as soon as you possibly can, because that four weeks, you will blink and that four weeks is up. And, but by the time that you get to that four week point, you've already done all of the legwork behind it to go ahead and get that processing. And I think there's a misconception that you can't start the process until those four weeks have occurred. And that just isn't true. I mean, do you have any pushback, Jennifer, with uh, your? No, you, you just have to start the process. And then at four weeks, um, you, you provide another piece of documentation that shows that the patient has been compliant with the four weeks of conservative treatment, compression, um, elevation, exercise, all of that. And then um, once they have that piece of paper, then they can submit for insurance approval. So um, there's, no, there's no need to wait um, to get approval. You know, even if you have a hesitant patient, you can still get approval and then they could say, no, thank you. And then that's okay, right? right. But then right. there's no reason to wait and then find out that, oh, the patient does want this device, would benefit, and now you have another potentially four weeks that you're waiting for. Because sometimes just, not just even Medicare, but any insurance process can be a few weeks, right? So the sooner you get that process started, the better and the, and the easier, really. Right. One other thought is that some areas don't have a CLT, don't have a lymphedema therapist. Um, so I do work with a lot of rural areas or just poor access. So Medicare's requirement is compression, elevation, and exercise. It's not therapy. Um, and so unfortunately, if we don't have access to a therapist or there's a wait list or other barriers, the patient can do exercise, compression, and elevation for four weeks. They do not have to go to a certified lymphedema therapist. We it like just them. needs to be documented, right? <laughs> Yep. Right. Okay. And there's another question about the insurance as well. So I think we covered that pretty well. Um, one other question is about how quickly after breast reconstruction, can you use the pump? And um, Jennifer, you work quite a bit with oncology patients and breast cancer patients. What, what is your recommendation? Um, I will always have a conversation with the, the plastic surgeon. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's not going to be in your first four weeks post-op. Um, and there's, there's so many variables to that. So I'm not really comfortable saying anything other than I have a close relationship with our, my referring um, physicians and, and yeah. we'll, we'll talk about that. They're, they're very clear about uh, hands-on or hands-off with their patients and I want it to be a collaborative thing. Um, and, so, and also, you know, if there, if there's an expander in there or things like that. So, yeah, exactly. And, um, we agree, everyone should agree that it is the, the provider's choice, you know, the surgeon's choice when they, they all have their own guidelines and when they want hands-on, they will um, let you know. And that's, we follow the same guidelines, but I will say we do have conversations with um, surgeons about um, treating peripherally, you know, like if, if certainly if they have breast reconstruction, we don't want to be um, utilizing the pneumatic device over the breast, but maybe in the trunk to pull fluid away from the breast to you know enhance healing or if they're having distal arm swelling maybe utilize it in the arm uh, only um, in conjunction with self manual lymph drainage or working with your your therapist but um, you know definitely it it comes down to having that conversation with the healthcare team. Mm -hmm. um, what is the follow up for the stable patient? 
and if pump setting is still appropriate. What is the follow-up for the stable patient? I'm not sure I understand that. In the maintenance phase, like a patient who's stabilized and kind of in a maintenance phase. Like what is the follow-up, right? Yeah, that's a good question because um, unfortunately lymphedema patients don't often have follow-ups. Um, do you have a follow-up protocol for your patients, Brett, um, Brandy or Jennifer? Not really. Um, we do see some patients for maintenance. Um, especially some of our patients who are higher risk, who are um, develop cellulitis significantly, um, high risk for ulcerations, things like that. So we do follow them. Um, however, you know, as far as what we set for that patient, when they leave the clinic, we usually give them a full breakdown of kind of what we want them to do with that, with that pneumatic device. Um, so whether that's using it five days a week initially and then tapering themselves down as their condition becomes more stable um, with their home programs and things like that. And then we always make sure that those patients know that they can call us. So even if there's not a true follow-up for the patients actually seen in the clinic, that patient can always give us a call. And then we also make sure that that patient realizes that they can call their rep. So yeah. that if they do have any questions about, you know, obviously the rep's going to refer back to me if the patient thinks they need to increase frequency, anything along that line, or add any um, special settings to be able to um, increase drainage to a specific area, things like that. And my rep will, will message me back for that. But uh, we try to keep that avenue open between the rep and with myself. Yeah, and I think it's a bigger problem, uh, you know, that we have treating lymphedema episodically and not with a chronic model of care, right? I mean, it, it's not treated like congestive heart failure or renal disease where they get regular follow-ups. And it's something that always um, bothers me and I, and I talk about it all the time, but uh, it, it does need to change, you know? Um, so it isn't the responsibility of the, the therapist to actually continue to follow up with that patient. Um, it's, a, it's a bigger problem, I think, that, that we need to kind of address systemically. Um, so thank you. Let me see here. I'm happy to hear that planning and education. I'd love to have the research. I will send that. Um, I think, how soon do you start chest MLD and or FlexiTouch after a seroma has been diagnosed and medically managed. Anyone want to respond to that? Immediately. <laughs> I was going to say, I've, I've seen a lot of seromas. Immediately. Yes. Immediately. <laughs> Especially if they're yeah. small, you start right away. Absolutely. Um, but we also know that some of the larger ones need to be aspirated and managed sometimes even surgically, right? Um, any, right? any comments, Jennifer, do you ever, do you have so many, any protocols in terms of seromas or you treat them right away? Um, yeah, it just depends if they're getting aspirated or um, usually it's, it's you know, a few weeks post-op. So once they're, uh, the patient's in my care, I'm, I'm starting hands-on with them. Um, yeah. So yeah. Okay. Julie, in terms of seromas and um, even like expander placement, um, that's a lot of times where I would utilize a treatment surrounding that affected area. So if it was a seroma that had to be drained or if it was a super sensitive, even an open or wound, um, then I'd still want to get some MLD proximally um, to try to reroute the fluid and hopefully try to um, help improve lymphatic drainage prior to, you know, the expander change or the um, seroma drainage. Yeah. Right. At least, at least open those regional nodes. Let's get something mm -hmm. flowing through there so that we can assist. Definitely. Okay. And then there's just one other question. Um, it's on tr uh, frequency and, and I think it's, it's for a pediatric patient. So I, I think I can probably address this afterwards in an email uh, with this particular clinician. Um, so I think we are at 10 after, and that's exactly what we had talked about. So um, thank you all so much for attending, and we really appreciate it. And thank you, um, Jennifer and Brandy and Helen for joining in. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. It was a pleasure. Have a great night, everyone.